Hi everybody, this is Dr. A. I've got a quick review of molecular techniques. We're going to look at basic concepts and this is for a clinical chemistry review. So uh, molecular techniques are assays that target nucleic acid instead of protein, so that's DNA and RNA, and they consist of binding a nucleic acid to its complementary target nucleic acid sequence. It is designed to detect changes at the DNA or RNA level rather than to detect a synthesized product like a protein. So the um, techniques that are used in a clinical lab to identify nucleic acid sequences are the enzymatic cleavage of nucleic acid, gelled electrophoresis, the enzymatic amplification of target sequences, and the hybridization with nucleic acid probes. And I'm going to have vid videos that follow up on some of these techniques more specifically. So as a review, DNA stores human genetic information. It will di dictate an amino acid sequence of peptides and proteins. DNA also co uh, contains a lot of code that is just control code. So only a small percentage of the DNA in our cells are actual recipes for proteins and peptides. DNA is composed of two strands of nucleotides, which are made of a sugar, a phosphate group, and a heterocyclic nitrogenous base, which are the A, T, Cs, and Gs of your DNA code. The purines are the A and the G, the adenine and the guanine, and the pyrimidines are the T and the C, the thymine and the cytosine, and then also uracil and RNA. Strands are arranged in a double helix. And the helical structure is stable due to many hydrogen bonds between the base pairs and the hydrophobic interactions between the bases. The bonds can be broken and strands uh, denatured and separated. Now, um, the base pairs always are going to bind A to T or T to A and then C to G or G to C. And that is consistent and it always happens that way. So in this graphic, you see just a quick representation of a cell with its nucleus. Inside the nucleus, you have chromosomes. Here's a chromosome represented. Inside a chromosome, you have your genetic information or your DNA. And this representation shows the four bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, each in their own color, and then the uh, sugar phosphate backbone in this double helix structure. DNA replication makes an exact copy of the DNA and it copies the entire genome. Uh, replication happens during cell division when a parent cell makes two brand new daughter cells. Each of the DNA strands serves as a te template so that each daughter cell will have one old strand paired up with one brand new strand. Um, DNA transcription is the production of messenger RNA from DNA in order to synthesize protein later. So it's copying the recipe, the code for that protein from the DNA into an RNA. Uh, and so both of these processes will happen inside of the nucleus. RNA is present in human cells and is chemically similar to DNA. It differs from DNA in three ways. Ribose replaces deoxyribose um, as the sugar. So that's the R in RNA versus the D in DNA. Uracil will replace thymine as a purine base, so then you have pairing of A to U and C to G. And then RNA is single-stranded. There are three distinct forms of RNA. There's a ribosomal RNA, which is 80% of the RNA in your cell. Then there's messenger RNA and transfer RNA. And your messenger RNA nucleotides are recycled and reused. And RNA works together with DNA to synthesize protein. Uh, this graph represents um, the synthesis of protein using RNA, uh, but I just want to highlight here what's represented. We have the messenger RNA that is feeding through a ribosome, and the ribosome is built with ribosomal RNA, and then transfer RNAs are bringing um, the amino acids and adding them to um, the amino acid chain. So you see one coming in here, add, fix and add it to this chain that's growing, and this one's leaving and they do so by matching codons, and I'm going to explain this in just a second. So here's a representation of DNA with its not charged on its bases, and then this one is a single-stranded RNA, and you can see that uracil is an RNA, whereas thymine is in DNA. 
So translation is a process of turning the messenger RNA into protein, uh, and it does that by reading every three bases as a codon, and that codes for one amino acid, and the codon in the messenger RNA uh, will have a match to the transfer RNA, so an, an A to a U and a, T, um, a C to a G, A to a U, C to a G. Um, and uh, if it matches, then the it's, if it's complementary, then the transfer RNA can add the amino acid that it carries to the growing chain. And so this wheel here represents the codon that corresponds to the amino acid that's being carried. So, uh, for example, if you look, sorry, C, C, and then any of those, so it could be CCC or CCU or CCA or CCG, all codes for proline. CGU or CGC, CGA or CGG, all code for arginine. So you get the idea of how that goes here. And so the amino acids are added to the growing protein chain in the order of the code. And this process of translation will occur in the cytoplasm inside the ribosome. Now, if you have a, a genetic um, defect, something that's wrong at the genetic code level, then it can translate into the wrong amino acid being added to the chain. And that's where we can see some of the hemoglobinopathies, uh, some of the problems such as sickle cell, where there's a substitution to, of one amino acid for another, and it makes the uh, hemoglobin chain behave in a different way. So um, chromosomes, DNA is located in the chromosomes in the nucleus. Uh, you also have mitochondrial DNA in your mitochondria. The supercoiling of the DNA around histones will form the traditional chromosome um, X shape that we often see represented that is seen in the cell as it divides. The centromeres are the middle portion here that join the two arms of the chromosome. You have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, half of each pair will come from each parent. You have 22 autosomal pairs, and the 23rd pair is a sex chromosome, so that would be 46 chromosomes total. And you have 23,000 genes that are each at a specific location on a chromosome. This is a representation of a karyotype, so you see all 22 pairs with a sex chromosome pair here. And for every pair, you would get one of these from mom and one of these from dad whichever one it is that's to be determined by genetic testing, but you get the idea. So uh, genomic double-stranded DNA is enzymatically split into two strands. This is what happens in the cells, and then one of which will serve as a template for the synthesis of its complementary messenger RNA. And uh, this DNA is routinely denatured, so split into two strands. It can bind RNA, it can re-anneal and re-establish the original DNA always following the base pair rules. And because of all of that, we can use these processes as a foundation of the new nucleic acid hybridization assays because we know how it's going to behave. So how do we get this nucleic acid for testing? So you can extract DNA or RNA from a variety of specimen types. Commercial kits are available. The extracted DNA or RNA has to be free of each other, so no DNA and RNA, no RNA in the DNA, right? And also free of proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and any other contaminant that could interfere with testing. In the clinical assays, it is important to determine the nucleic acid degradation in an extracted specimen due to either extraction or storage, because it could affect the validity of the results. Restriction enzymes are enzymes produced by bacteria, and we use them because we figure out that they can cut human DNA at a specific base sequence. Uh, they, it looks for palindromes, which is a sequence that reads the same way forward as um, backward in the complementary chain here. And um, it um, will break the hydrogen bonds between the bases and the phosphoester bond of the backbone. So literally we'll cut it at a specific location. For ECOR1, it's going to be between the G and the A here. And so it makes uh, two pairs, um, which can stick then um, 
back to each other. And so if you use the same restriction enzyme to go cut DNA somewhere else in a, in a different type of cell, then you can take the gene from the one cell and add it uh, in, you know, basically add it to the this the first cell where you cut it the the first this top this one and it can stick back so this is basically how you can do gene splicing and uh, add genes uh, into um, other genetic material and so uh, this also allows for DNA identification of humans because uh, it cuts um, the human DNA uh, in unique pieces for each individual. So this is where you get RFLP, which stands for Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism. And it allows for the de definitive identification of individuals or the identification of certain chromosomal traits by alle alleles because of the way the restriction enzymes will cut and digest the uh, genetic material. The steps in RFLP are going to be incubating it with endonucleases, which are a restriction enzyme to produce DNA fragments of different lengths, which are unique to individuals, uh, or they're unique to the specific gene that you're looking for. Then you separate the fragments through gel electrophoresis, and they precipitate in the gel in a certain pattern. Uh, you do a southern blot uh, and um, incubation with markers and stuff so that you can x-ray and see and visualize the bands. Um, this graph here represents, for example, if you're testing for chromosome A and chromosome B, so a trait, you know, a certain trait A or trait B. If they are homozygous for the trait A, this is the pattern that you'll see. If they're heterozygous at AB, you will see the pattern for A and the pattern for B. If they're homozygous for B, then you see the pattern for B only, and then that's how you can see if they're homozygous or heterozygous for certain traits. And then lastly, um, note on quality and molecular testing. So some of the key quality issues that are seen in any clinical DNA-based assays is um, we can have quality issues with sample quality of preparation, the sensitivity of reagents to inactivating contaminants, the amplification bias and variability, the selection of appropriate controls to test the, the system, and uh, the efficiency of restriction enzymes, and then we can have issues with the reproducibility and cross-contamination of amplification reactions. So um, it's really important for people that do molecular testing to be well-trained in what they're doing and to follow all the prop proper protocols to the letter because there are good reasons why those protocols are put in, in place. So, so that's it for your basics. Uh, I have uh, some more videos coming. The next one's going to be on amplification.